All right. I think we will get started now because we want to make sure we have enough time to hear from everybody. Welcome, everyone. I'm Glenn Cohen. I'm a professor at Harvard Law School. I'm a deputy dean here, and I'm also the faculty director for the Petrie Film Center. My pleasure to welcome you and thank you for attending. It's also my pleasure to acknowledge the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and thank them for funding the work we've been doing on diagnosis in the home, of which this uh, webcast is part of it. I also want to mention as part of the same project, we have a new podcast series featuring some of the people who you see here on this panel called Petri Dishes. You can find it on the Apple Podcast Network, review, rate us, especially if it's good rating, rate us, and that's Petri Dishes. We've got a really exciting panel for us today, but I want to just do a few housekeeping points. Firstly, if you want to submit a question, you can do so through the Q&A function on Zoom or via Twitter, now X, at Petri Flon, at Petri Flon. You do not need to raise your hand or use the chats. Those are ways we will not be looking at those. Instead, that's the way to do it. And Chloe has helpfully put a link to the podcast I see in the chat function. Um, we'll share the fully captioned event video with all the registrants within about one to two weeks. So if you missed this or you want to watch it again because it was so good, one to two weeks, it'll be available in caption. And lastly, if you have any technical issues, we're having a technical problem, please email us at petri flown at law.harvard.edu. Okay. Well, with that uh, housekeeping, it's my pleasure to turn it over to David Simon. Now, Professor Simon, who is a postdoc on this project, and now he's an assistant professor at Northeastern. And David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Glenn. As Glenn said, my name is David Simon. I'm an associate professor at Northeastern University School of Law, formerly a postdoctoral fellow at the Petrie Flom Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. First, we have Dr. Adam Landman. He's an emergency physician and chief information officer at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's interested in innovative application of information technology to improve healthcare delivery. And he led an emergency department information systems modernization project, a three-year, $7 million custom software development project to move clinicians from paper-based to electronic documentation, among others. <clears throat> He's received a variety of grants and is quite interested in artificial intelligence and its application to healthcare. Our second panelist is Dr. Michael Abramoff. Dr. Abramoff <clears throat> is the Robert Wetzky Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Iowa with a joint appointment in the College of Engineering. Uh, he is an IIE, an IEE -E -E fellow, I get that right, I get the triple E, and an Arvo Gold, Gold Fellow. He's also the founder and executive chairman of Digital Diagnostics, an autonomous AI diagnostics company, who was the first in any field of medicine to get FDA clearance for an autonomous AI. Our final panelist is Professor Leah Fowler. She's a research assistant professor at the Health Law and Policy Institute at the University of Houston Law Center. <clears throat> Her work explores the intersection of consumer technology and health with a focus on smartphone applications and platform. She's published in a variety of outlets and has done some terrific work. So thank you to all of the panelists for joining us. We're gonna start with uh, Professor Landman and I will hand it over to him and begin the slideshow. Great. Thanks so much, David. Thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to join um, everyone today, and thanks for the nice introduction. I'm going to um, run through these um, slides really quickly and it's sort of start with a, a holistic overview of um, healthcare AI. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I just want to start by, um, by saying, you know, I'm a technologist. I love technology, but what we're really talking about here is using technology to improve the quintuple aim. And so our whole goal here is to find solutions, AI solutions <clears throat> that help improve population health, that improve the, the patient experience, that help improve the efficiency of healthcare delivery, um, and that also help us with advancing health equity, and very importantly, help with um, healthcare worker burnout. Um, and so ideally, we are looking for solutions that actually help improve all of these five aims, um, or at least many of them. Next slide. I um, I really like this um, figure by Justin Norden that kind of gives a quick um, glimpse of what's going on in healthcare AI. And the big takeaway is that 
there are AI solutions popping up to many areas of healthcare challenges, ranging from you know life sciences and and clinical trials research to um, administrative um, challenges like prior authorization and medical coding to um, analytics for pop health, um, and then to, even to patient-facing solutions um, like <clears throat> um, sensors um, and care navigation. And finally, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, AI solutions to help clinicians with clinical decision support or with documentation. Um, next slide. Not um, all of these um, use cases are equal though. Um, we wanna think about the use cases in terms of what the value add will be, but we are, but I also like to think of these use cases in terms of risk. So if you're applying AI to these areas, what is the risk? The risk for patient harm, for instance. Um, and so on the left-hand side are, are use cases that I think are lower risk and um, as you move to the right, higher risk. And so I think where many health systems are starting with AI strategies are towards, tends to be towards the left where the lower risk. And so we're seeing contact center automation or we just did um, a, an AI video. Um, in the middle are um, sort of medium risk where we're using it in clinical workflows, um, but we often have an expert such as a clinician in the loop. So human in the loop. Um, and then finally, I think where we're going to focus today's discussion is on diagnostics. Um, when we're having AI actually do a diagnosis or triage a patient, and I would say that's at the highest risk. So I want to um, share with you some real examples of things that um, we're working on just to give you a sense of where AI is in healthcare delivery. Next slide. The first example is on the lower, that I consider lower risk, and it's in our contact center. Um, and we're using a, a various forms of AI in our contact centers to help us with um, improving efficiency and also improving patient experience as well as employee experience. And we have a, a large contact center that handles patient questions related to our electronic health record. Our patients are increasingly using the patient portal and sometimes they have questions. Well, traditionally they called and our um, agents would answer their question. We are using a combination of um, interactive voice response system with um, natural language understanding though, to have the computer listen to, recognize the questions and then provide answers to um, those patients. And we've actually seen about a third of calls to our patient portal support desk are successfully handled by this IVR and AI combination. So it's really um, been showing a nice efficiency improvement and improvement in satisfaction. Next slide. Another example, and this is <clears throat> kind of in the middle bucket of kind of medium risk um, and where we use a human in the loop. Um, many um, sites, including um, my organization, are very interested in using generative AI to help with clinical documentation. Um, as providers, every time we see a patient, we have to document. That's for many reasons, including billing, legal, and also for clinical care continuity. <clears throat> um, and that takes quite a bit of time. And so the holy grail is, could you have a solution where um, AI does the documentation? And these solutions take the form of um, an app, a secure app running on a smartphone. Um, the patient um, provides their consent to have the patient provider um, conversation recorded. <clears throat> that um, secure recording is then securely sent to a commercial product in the cloud. And that commercial product then does speech recognition, natural um, language processing, um, natural language understanding, and then uses large language models to summarize um, the note um, and create a note um, that looks like any other provider note. Um, we are in early stages of testing this. I also wanna emphasize that the AI generated note has to be reviewed by the clinician to ensure that it's accurate and correct and has all the um, information included. It's then edited and signed off. And so we're in early stages of assessing this solution. Next slide. Another promising example is using AI to help with in-basket messages from patients. So we're really excited that we've seen um, a large growth in number of patients that are using online portals. One of the features that our patients um, really like is sending in-basket messages. So sending you know, secure email messages to their providers and care teams. And across the country, we've seen a huge growth um, in use of these tools, particularly after COVID. Well, this is great um, news and great engagement, 
but it's been very challenging for our practices and our physicians to keep up with responding to these messages while they're still keeping their usual in-person clinic visits and other clinical load. And so we're in early stages of investigating AI, <clears throat> in particular generative AI, that can review the messages coming in from patients, classify them, <clears throat> and then once they're classified, we can help route them to the appropriate person to handle that message. We're also in early stages of investigating how well AI could actually draft a response to an in-basket message. Those messages would then be reviewed, need to be reviewed by a clinician, edited, um, and then ultimately sent to the patient by the clinician. Next slide. A final example, um, <clears throat> which is on the diagnostic side, I'm gonna share a research example. It's an exciting um, study that was recently published by researchers from Mass General Hospital, as well as MIT and Chang Gung Memorial Hospital. And they developed an algorithm that can predict um, uh, lung cancer risk from a single um, low-dose low CT scan of the chest. <clears throat> and you can really see the power of this if you look at the image in the bottom right. Um, if you look at image A, when an expert radiologist looked at image A, you can see the area in the circle, they rated that as low risk of um, lung cancer, um, a lung rad score of two. When the AI algorithm developed in this study, which is called Sybil, evaluated image A, it rated it as a high risk for cancer in the 75th percentile. And image B is the same patient, but two years later. And now as a human looking at image B, it's very clear there's a new speculated solid mass, um, very concerning for um, cancer. And so this is an extremely exciting, this is very early stage, this is a research study, um, but this is very exciting because this starts to show AI as a diagnostic tool that is um, exceeding human capabilities. Um, next slide. And I think as you know, we all want to move towards using AI for medical diagnosis at the point of care. And I think these are some of the characteristics and things that we need to ensure um, exist before we can really start using all of these tools. And I think we're going to probably have much more discussion on this. But most importantly, we need to make sure that the algorithms are safe and that they're reliable. But we also need to have um, to look at the benefit and the return on investment because there are costs to these tools and we need to ensure that there's value being added. Um, in some cases, FDA approval may be necessary. And I think the rules and regulations regarding which types of algorithms need FDA approval is, um, <clears throat> is evolving. And so there's a, there's a real opportunity here to better understand this. Um, and then finally, we need to ensure that these algorithms can be applied without bias to all patients. And if there is bias, we need to be able to understand that bias and ideally um, remove the bias. We also need to be thinking, you know, there is data involved here and need to ensure that the privacy and security of the um, individual's data, as well as the data used to create the algorithms. When possible, ideally, these algorithms should also be transparent so clinicians and others can understand how the algorithms are working. That may not be possible in all cases, but when it is, we should try to bring transparency and certainly transparency about the algorithm's performance. And finally, in some cases, we may need to be transparent <clears throat> in um, explaining to patients when we're using AI and, and how we're using AI. Um, so I look forward to um, talking with the entire panel and diving deeper into some of these issues. Great, thank you so much, Adam. I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. Sorry, I was on mute and I'm also uh, in a hospital environment. So I'm, I'm so sorry I'm not wearing a tie and looking decent like everyone else. I've been continuously in the hospital because of family circumstances for a few weeks now. Um, very uh, excited to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And Adam uh, laid it out very, very carefully and very, very well. Um, let me begin uh, with, what about me? Um, my name is Michael Abramov. I'm a practicing um, a retina specialist, like uh, uh, David already mentioned in the beginning. Um, I do notice we do not see my face right now. So as long as that's OK, I'm, I'm good. Um, I am also, as he mentioned, uh, the creator of that first autonomous uh, AI. And that took uh, a long time. Started meeting in 2010 with FDA. Uh, hey, I want a computer to make a medical decision. How do we go about it? And that led to a very fruitful uh, meeting of minds for years and years and years. And that led to an ethical framework for AI that has, I think, been really important in getting stakeholder support, all stakeholders really in healthcare, to support the use of 
especially autonomous AI, because as you, as Adam mentioned, uh, the perceived risk of autonomous AI is, is probably the greatest, and we can discuss it a little bit also. Um, I think it's uh, been an interesting journey since then, because 2018, FDA uh, authorized uh, this, uh, this AI to be used uh, for patient care without uh, human oversight. Specifically, it diagnoses uh, a complication of diabetes called diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, which are the most important causes of blindness. So it's, uh, well, you know, with Adam, it serves a, a need. Uh, it's a major cause of blindness. It can prevent this because it leads to early treatment and management. It's also uh, traditionally a great source of health disparities. Um, and that's another reason to, to use AI to improve access for these patients. And in fact, multiple randomized clinical trials coming out this year and already came out are showing that indeed health disparities are improved. And in fact, in the Baltimore area with black uh, Americans having the same amount, 100%, of diabetic eye exams now, thanks to autonomous AI as, as, as white and Hispanic patients. So really it can resolve uh, very persistent health disparities that have been plaguing us for often decades uh, and seemingly unsolvable even by throwing resources and money at it. So that's exciting because, you know, that what it all started with was really, um, you know, building autonomous AIs to hopefully improve outcomes, uh, health equity, uh, population health, and it's indeed uh, now showing scientific evidence that all this this trouble that everyone went to is worth it. But like I said, it was not uh, you know easy steps FDA, but it also required, for example, a national committee of quality assurance. And many of you are providers and are probably familiar with measures like HEDIS and MIPS, uh, which until then always said that a human needs to close the care gap, as it's known. Uh, and that language was changed, and now a care gap can be closed with an autonomous AI. So there's all these small, detailed steps that need to be taken for, before you can actually say, well, this is now, you know, being widely deployed in clinic and, and uh, is useful for, for solving these, these, these problems that we have in healthcare. Another step was reimbursement. I didn't really see that very explicitly, Adam, on your slide, which was very helpful as a, as a framework for our panel discussion. But um, you may be aware of Fair Therapeutics, a company that was uh, very successful, had uh, FDA approval for an app, and I'm looking at Leah, uh, for um, uh, addiction and curing addiction, showing in randomized clinical trials that it worked. Uh, so that everything, you know, all the, all the, the checkboxes were checked, except that they had a hard time for various reasons why they didn't get reimbursement and ultimately, that killed the company and it went bankrupt uh, now a few months ago. And so a very useful AI technology that was shown to benefit patients that already had FDA approval didn't make it and now will not benefit patients and that technology essentially is lost. So I think reimbursement is, is a very important factor, but that of course requires every stakeholder in healthcare to be supportive. Uh, for example, physicians uh, often fear job loss uh, it's not only uh, job satisfaction, but literally, you know, will I still have a job 10 years from now? I'm often asked these questions by residents and fellows. And so AI reads uh, to these worries. And that also, of course, can lead to lack of stakeholder support from physician organizations. And that is typically, um, you know, um, a problem if you want to get uh, reimbursement. And so payers, of course, need to support it. There needs to be an ROI. Uh, ethicists need to support the patient organization need to support it. And I think the work we did on the ethical framework that I already mentioned, and essentially making the step from rather than talking about ethics, measuring ethics, a uh, concept called metrics for ethics, where you say, well, this AI meets this bioethical principle uh, 1.5 on, on some scale, uh, and actually being able to have various metrics. There's, of course, many of them that were published uh, a few years ago. I think that really helped get these stakeholders on board and understand that we were addressing any concerns they could have, and Adam listed many of them proactively rather than reactively, as often is seen, you know, in other instances of new technology, let's uh, for example, gene therapy. So I think a very worthwhile journey, um, stakeholder support, and that ultimately lead, led to CMS and late, later all payers. Um, uh, you know, reimbursing this at a, at a level where there's a there's also a sustainable business model, which is of course important for 
sustainable R&D and, uh, and continued investment by VCs and now also private equity. Um, I think with you know the results of the randomized clinical trials coming out this year, that, that the circle is almost round, that this can be done. You can really take an algorithm, take care of bias, address all the issues that, that maybe with ethics, get stakeholders report, ultimately get reimbursed and, and make it benefit patients. And so I think it's really worthwhile to, to discuss these various steps, especially this is still a uh, the, the AI, you know, the first AI we, we created and we have many more, is still a prescription device. So it's not for home use. We're not there yet. I think the FDA is not yet comfortable with, with this being used in the home. And so how do we move from the current state to autonomous use in, let's say, an app uh, at home? You know, what are the steps needed to be taken? And absolutely, I think we will get there, but, uh, you know, step by step. So... I will stop here and um, maybe Lee as the next. Yes. Uh, Hi, Leah. Yes. I am next. Just a sec. Let me get my PowerPoint shared. All right. Can everyone see that? Great. Um, so. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. It's so exciting to be on a panel with such great speakers. Um, and it's exciting because of the topic, because the promise of technology to move diagnosis out of the confines of the clinic and into the homes of patients is actually a really big and exciting topic. And one facet of that that particularly interests me a great deal is the way that consumer health technology is often regulated very differently than similar data and tools in a medical or scientific context. And I often like to think about this disconnect in two major buckets. One is more privacy and security and confidentiality, and the other is safety and efficacy and accuracy. And so that's actually what I'm gonna talk about briefly today. And I'll be pivoting to the other digital tools, which certainly can, but don't always include artificial intelligence that are one of the subjects of today's event. And these are tools that have, but maybe don't always live up to the potential to transform medical diagnosis in the home, especially in a consumer context, and a couple of the legal and ethical issues that they raise. Now, this is kind of an ambitious 10 minutes, um, but I plan to start with a very high level examination of our very basic assumptions about at least our traditional notions of healthcare, maybe a little bit further back than the, the evolution that we've talked about, what our, pre our previous two speakers have talked about, and then consider how we engage in health promoting activities and activities that even look and feel a lot like diagnosing and treating from the consumer perspective, even if it technically isn't specifically in a consumer context. But like I alluded to when I talked about the things that interest me in my research, the types of protections you get as a patient or the types of protections you may expect are very different than the types of protections you get as a consumer. And I will illustrate that point with two examples of digital health tools that are commonly used. Now, when I talk about a healthcare context, what I mean is settings we typically think about when we think about the provision of care, like a clinic or a hospital. And they're among some of the most highly regulated settings in the United States. So because of those complex laws and regulations, we have certain expectations about the care we're going to receive and how our personal health data are going to be treated, at least as we traditionally think about it. And I know these are things that Dr. Landman actually mentioned when he was discussing the things that we need in place to advance AI diagnosis. And one of the first big ones is that we expect that the treatments we receive are going to be safe and effective and that we have enough evidence about them to make informed choices about the risks and benefits and that the diagnostic tools that are being used are going to be re reasonably accurate and precise and that we individually as patients don't generally have to do independent research to be sure of any of those things. And the second thing we assume is that our data will be kept private and secure and in some cases we have expectations about confidentiality. However, it is worth putting a Huge caveat on all of that, that um, just because these are expectations doesn't mean it's something that everybody gets. Um, so for example, not everyone receives the same quality of care, either because of location or stigma or resources or structural barriers. But for simplicity, many of us can go to the doctor and have these basic expectations about things like accuracy and privacy. And for the most part, those expectations are going to be met. But of course, a medical encounter is not the only place that people manage their health. We would certainly not be here today if that were true. And so, for example, you individually may be tracking your calories or your steps in an app, or you may be using a wearable like a smartwatch or a ring. And some of these wearables also sync with other apps that aggregate large data sets that can use artificial intelligence to do things like improve health predictions. And this can span health categories. So it can include weight loss or menstrual cycle syncing to mental health to sleep and so much more. And truly the space is full of products and services and advice that viewed in their most positive light can help us live our healthiest lives. And they're tools that can liberate healthcare from just the confines of the clinic and bring it directly to consumers in their homes. 
But one of the things I alluded to is that our assumptions about privacy and accuracy in a medical context do not always translate into a consumer context. And it depends on many variables that are not always particularly clear to consumers. And in the interest of time, I will give you only two examples, though there are many examples. But the first is that in a consumer context, your data are treated differently. Now, many of you watching know that HIPAA and its state level counterparts protect health data privacy in very certain contexts. So while some states offer more robust protections, HIPAA itself is only providing privacy and security protections for certain types of identifiable information possessed or controlled by covered entities and their business associates, which is not everyone. And so importantly, the vast majority of cases, HIPAA is not going to apply to consumer techs like your, uh, your smartphone apps or uh, any health information you're receiving or sharing on like a social media platform. And second is that most apps and many wearables are not going to be FDA regulated medical devices, even if they look the same or similar to a device that is FDA regulated. And this is in part because the FDA has pretty broad discretion about how it interprets a product's intended use, which is a special term of art in the law. And further legislation actually carved out certain types of products from the FDA's definition of medical device. So now it ex excludes things like low risk devices intended for maintaining or encouraging a healthy lifestyle, which includes a lot of consumer products. And that's all a very long winded way of saying that many products don't have to obtain any sort of pre-market approval or authorization or even baseline demonstrate that they work before they enter the consumer tech market. Now, of course, a lingering question in the background of all of this is why would it matter that things that look and feel like healthcare or health information are treated differently depending on the context? And I would argue that it certainly can be a big deal, especially as our interests in optimizing our health through consumer technologies grows and private for-profit companies continue to offer oftentimes very promising technological solutions to the problems of healthcare in the United States. But if we continue to position consumer technologies, even as perfect substitutes for evidence-based care, it does raise important legal and ethical questions, especially since at least right now, the prevailing advice to consumers in the absence of more robust legal and regulatory protections is unlike in a healthcare setting for you to do your own diligence and your own research on these technologies before you pick one that you wanna use. But I would offer that that's actually really difficult advice to follow. And I won't just tell you, I will actually show you with two examples involving femtech, which is actually a really broad category of technologies that address female health needs. Um, and this is most commonly refers to period and fertility tracking apps. And I pick femtech specifically because it's super easy to understand why accuracy and privacy matter in this context. So if an app you're using to achieve or avoid conception is not accurate, you will either be not be able to become pregnant when you want to be, or you may unintentionally become pregnant when you don't want to be. And depending on where you live, you may have limited access to the full spectrum of reproductive care. And further, menstrual data is legally and medically significant. So for example, the date of your last period is relevant to determining gestational age and period and fertility trackers at their most basic, taking away all of the technological shine are often just repositories of dates of menstruation. So let's talk about what it might look like for a consumer to do their due diligence and try and pick an accurate and private app in this space. And we'll start with accuracy. Now, most people make decisions about the types of digital health tools they're going to download at the point of download. And for most of us, this is going to be the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. And one of the first things you might see is images that the App Store shows you. And this is an example on the slide here. And if you're looking for something that feels like an assurance of accuracy, your interest might be piqued like, by claims like the ones that my teeny tiny arrow points to. And it says, automatic and accurate predictions of fertility. And of course, images are not the only thing you're going to find at the point of download. You'll also find things like your app description. And these words are even smaller, but what you need to know is it's echoing the same guarantees. It's saying that one of the features is automatic and accurate predictions of fertility. So what can we conclude from this? Could we conclude that the product accurately predicts when you're fertile? And if it can do that, can it also predict when you're infertile? And if it can do both of those things, couldn't you use it to achieve or avoid conception? But we can check one more spot just to be sure, and that's the terms of service. And of course, terms of service are not documents that people often read. This one in particular is not available in the app store. I had to, to Google it. And what you would find if you read it is likely a health disclaimer. And this tells a very different story than the images in the app store. Suddenly it's all language about how the information and predictions can't be used for diagnosis or treatment. And you should not use this product for conception or contraception. And if you trust it, you do it at your own risk. And it's just interesting to think about how these documents tell very different stories than the most obvious consumer facing advertisements. And just to do this again for privacy, this is a screenshot from a different app and what you'll see where the arrow was pointing, if you can read it, I know it's very small, 
is that it says the app never shares or sells your personal data. And I want you to ask yourself to reflect on what you think the word never means, because this is an excerpt from the app's privacy policy where it shows a non-exhaustive list of the ways the app does share your information with third parties. And I don't know about you, but that's not what never means to me. Now, I would hate for you to think I'm just picking on a couple questionable apps. I have no opinions on the products that I've shown you here. I just want to show you something that is fairly common in the health app space, which is apps advertise things that consumers want, even if it's not necessarily a thing they truly offer. But while I just talked about femtech, I do want to be clear that this discussion goes far beyond it. It matters in a lot of contexts, especially ones that um, we might think of as low risk, but maybe aren't. So contexts in which the risk of physical harm is greater if the product isn't accurate or circumstances in which privacy and security are important because the risks of things like stigma and discrimination are higher. But no matter what, even if it doesn't fall into one of those buckets, we want products to do what they claim to do because even if they can't actively harm you, if it's not working, it's a missed opportunity for improvement. And if we don't read the terms of service and privacy policies, the way they advertise product, uh, their products really does matter. But my final point, because I know I'm coming up on my time, is what I want for you to take away from this is if we want consumer technologies to be truly disruptive and game changers and how individuals self-manage their health or diagnose in the home, it's really important to assess honestly where they live up to those promises and maybe where they still fall a little bit short. And this disconnect between assumptions and protections and the limits of consumer due diligence is just one piece of that puzzle. And with that, thank you so much. Great, thank you all of the panelists for really terrific presentations touching on so many different issues. I think um, what I'd like to start with is a question that all of you can respond to if you'd like. Leah talked about the more unregulated zone uh, of products, the, the zone where at least FDA is not doing the regulating. Uh, Dr. Abr Abramoff talked about his product, the product that he helped develop in the context of FDA regulation. And then Dr. Landman talked a, a little bit about both. And so I'm wondering what each of the panelists thinks about the current FDA framework, the current framework for evaluating these kinds of products and how we might think about changing it or modifying it in the future. So I'll pose that question first to Dr. Landman. You know, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I think the challenge is there's ambiguity in the current framework <clears throat> um, around, um, you know, what is regulated and what's not regulated. Um, and so I think um, the CRISPR we can we can be on where the level of regulation is is um, is is really important. Um, and and ultimately, I think that. Um, there are some aspects of regulation that can really help accelerate um, this work, right? So, um, and and frankly, may also help. <clears throat> what I'm seeing right now is that a lot of centers are doing the same work on these AI tools um, because we're all trying to adhere to the principles that were described by um, everyone um, earlier, and so we're all trying to do our diligence to test and validate. Um, and ensure the safety um, and equity of all of these tools. And if there were ways that we could agree on and potentially through regulation, um, set up ways that there were standardized processes and expectations and then transparency into that process for those who are consuming, um, consuming these tools, I think it could help accelerate some of this work. So um, uh, overall, I think that um, particularly as AI advances and there's an increasing desire to use it at the point of care, either on the clinician's facing side or with the patients as Heather um, described, I think there's a real opportunity for us to bolster the processes and maybe even use a public partner private um, partnership to, um, to do that. Michael, did you have any thoughts? You're muted. Sorry, I, I love debate. So let me pu put a, pull up two small points and then uh, otherwise I agree with uh, Len, uh, Adam and, uh, and Leah. But uh, first, um, the concept that assistive AI is in some way safer than autonomous AI or that autonomous AI is, is high risk uh, is probably you know, debatable. 
Um, and the, the, the study I like to refer to is Fenton et al. from 2007, where there was an FDA-approved mammography um, AI that was validated under FDA purview as an essentially in an autonomous fashion compared to radiologists that had really high performance and therefore was approved. That was not the way it was used. It was used as an assistive AI in conjunction with a radiologist where it indicated lesions such as calcifications and nodules on the mammogram that supposedly the radiologist would then look more carefully at. That had never been validated as a system, the assistive AI plus the clinician. And it was shown because everyone expected, well, duh, with an AI, the clinician will obviously be better. So uh, Fenton et al. decided to study that in 200,000 women, and they showed that the outcomes for women diagnosed by the radiologist assisted with the AI were worse than that for the radiologist alone. So even in this simple case, AI does not always make things better in an assistive fashion. So I'm not sure whether the risk of an autonomous AI is actually higher. It's perceived that way, but at least we can test it as a deterministic system rather than a variable interaction of physicians with an AI. That it is relevant is shown by the Boeing 737 MAX example, where Boeing developed an AI. Uh, it was you know, even tested with very experienced pilots and it was fine. And then less experienced pilots were starting to use it, they overcorrected and two planes were put into the ground, as you may remember a few years ago. Again, an assistive AI, really hard to validate because you need a broad spectrum of expertise on the sides of the physician, oh, sorry, the, the expert being assisted. So that is one aspect that is relevant because we're you know, also discussing uh, LLMs and ChatGPT. The second is that what Leah said is absolutely true, that these apps have the potential to maybe harm patients in some way or at least not get them the care. But more importantly, like you said, uh, David and Adam, there is this tightly regulated, pretty, you know, and, and, and to my, in my view, we're in a sort of Goldilocks situation with this tightly regulated AI right now, where it's reimbursed, it's uh, regulated, people feel comfortable with it. But there's this other AI that is actually harming patients that is not regulated. Specifically, I'm referring to my friend Ziad Obermeyer's paper in Science in 2020, where he studied an AI created by a payer, I won't name names, that was used to create to determine a care pathways for people with uh, lung disease. It turned out that because cost was used as a proxy for the severity of the disease, that actually black patients with less cost for the same severity of disease in the training set were actually being directed to less uh, suboptimal care and being harmed compared to other patients. So this AI that was in a non-regulated space was causing harm and you would say, well, okay, we identified it, and manufacturer actually improved, and they were done. The problem is that it is being cited widely by Congress, including by the Office of, uh, sorry, and regulators, including the Office of Civil Rights in HHS, which, as you may know, has a proposed rule 1557 to essentially make liable anyone who uses digital health products where are biased. And so the sheer fact that this existed, that it was harming patients in a totally different space, can have a lead to a backlash on all AI in this case. And we have seen it with gene therapy years ago, where gene therapy was doing really well in the 90s. Some identical experiments were done. It was shut down. It was dead for 20 years and took a long time to recover to get FDA to prove in, in gene therapy uh, looks turner. So long story short, I, I think um, the, the non-regulated space is really important and is already having an impact what happens there on the regulated space. Thanks, Leah. Do you have any uh, comments I, about that? I do. And I actually, it, it's a way of building on and echoing two of the points that were made about transparency and the role of reimbursement, because obviously more tightly regulating in the space raises a lot of new challenges. So one of the one of the benefits of having sort of a light regulatory touch is products can enter the market cheaper, they can, people can access them at a lower price point. So the more regulation you add in, the, it's going to drive up the costs of good and tested and evidence-based products, which may in turn, especially in the health app space, drive people to download things that are free and use the things that aren't tested. So that's, that is a challenge and a, and a tight line you have to walk. And the other one is, of course, this transparency issue. And I think a lot of consumers don't generally understand you know, what a product's intended use is and whether it's going to be FDA regulated or whether it's not. And you even see apps uh, 
advertising things like FDA registered, which is of course doesn't, it's not a thing that really means anything other than that the FDA knows that it exists. And so until I think we're able to communicate to consumers what these types of distinctions mean, uh, I think we're going to continue to have struggles with uh, apps that are more heavily regulated and may have gone through all of the FDA approval or clearance processes and these other ones that look visibly very similar, if not identical to them that have had none of the oversight. Great. There are a couple questions in the chat that I wanted to try to combine in some way. They're more technical questions. So um, perhaps uh, Adam and Michael might be better able to answer them than Leah, but maybe Leah a, knows a lot about computational <laughs> computer science or something that I'm not aware of. Um, the questions are really directed towards the potential functions of AI tools. So one question is, is it possible to assign a probability of a diagnosis using an AI tool? And the second question is, is it possible that to design an AI that doesn't itself produce a diagnosis, but suggests tests that could produce a diagnosis? So similar questions that are relating to the process of AI. I mean, I can, happy to start if that's helpful. I Yes, there are, I mean, the, the short answer is yes, right? So there, there are, clinical decision support tools or AI that can suggest new tests. Um, in fact, that's common. It, it might be a recommendation to say, you know, consider, you know, consider these strategies um, for the patient. I think for associating a probability, um, it may depend on what AI technique is used on whether it can associate a probability. I think in some of these tools, some of the best practices we've seen is showing the test characteristics overall um, for the um, for the tool and making that very transparent to the end users. And um, if whether or not it can display a specific probability for the specific patient um, uh, may be a little dependent on the techniques. But let me see if Michael wants to correct or add anything to what I'm sharing. It's, it's interesting. I absolutely agree that it can be done. I think um, what patients want to know more than anything is, is the outcome, right? What, what is my clinical outcome going to be? And can I do anything about it? So I think that's really more relevant. This can be a tool, the probability of, well, how, you know, how should they adjust my risk? And is it worth to do a certain intervention or a certain extra diagnostic with its own risk and you know, weighing that with risk to maybe the disease I, I may get or the poor outcome I can get. So I can see where that might be useful. It's really interesting to see the discussions uh, for the autonomous AI that, that we created where FDA was actually concerned about the too complex output, meaning you can give a very high level output. If there's this level of disease and it has these associations with other diseases and these risks of progressions to various uh, end stages. Uh, and FDA, and this is for a primary care physician primarily, so not let alone for the patient, they considered all these outputs too complex and really wanted a dichotomous, yes, no, um, you know, bad disease, good disease, or, or no disease, uh, referral uh, to a specialist for more care, or in this case, an eye care specialist, warranted. So they really were focused on making this as simplistic as possible. And so that was a really interesting process to go through. So rather than very sophisticated outputs, they think it's better to have as simple outputs as possible. And from a interaction with AI outputs, that's probably the right decision. And that may also have implications for, for apps, uh, you know, in the non-regulated space where clearly, you know, uh, keep it simple is, is, is often better. So I don't think, I'm not sure that helps with, with answering your question, but I think that's an interesting aspect. Yeah, that actually leads to another question for Leah, which is how much information is the appropriate amount of information yeah, for consumers? Exactly. And how do we know what's the right amount? And then do we treat doctors as consumers or do we treat them as a special kind of consumer as the law traditionally has treated them? So I guess obviously two different questions here. One of them being what's the right amount of information that we can give consumers? And I would offer that it's not just what is the right amount, but how do we give it to them? So if we have a lot of literature that suggests people aren't reading things like the privacy policies in terms of service, inundating those documents with more information that people are not going to read is not going to be helpful. But if people are making decisions at the point of download, and we know that apps or digital products are advertising their products in specific ways, be it puffery or whatever you want to call it, we have to be very careful about the information that they're sharing there. So if an app says that it's accurate or that it never shares your data, I think one place we need to be clear is that that baseline should be true. 
And so whether that means we need more information and we need to make documents that are already 30 pages long into 60 pages long, we don't think that's necessarily the right answer, but we need to be more innovative in the ways that we share information and ensure that the information that people do see is correct. So the other question that you asked is, should we be treating physicians as just a different type of consumer? And I, I would say that it in a classic lawyer fashion, it depends on the context in which we're talking about these digital tools, right? So if we expect physicians to be making recommendations about apps for, for their specific patients to use, we should be treating them, I believe, as more of a, a learned intermediary, somebody who knows more about the product that they're recommending. And so, yes, I would expect that their understanding of the types of protections and regulations and evidence behind that product is, is greater than your average consumer in a consumer context. And that's really challenging when you talk about the consumer health tech space more generally, because if there are so many products, it would be almost unreasonable to expect any physician to just know every single app and all of the different nuance of it. But if they're going to be recommending a specific one, yes, I would expect that there'd be a certain higher level of knowledge associated with that recommendation. Can I build a little bit on Leah's great comments there, which is, um, I actually think there's an opportunity and a need to educate physicians more on these tools, right? So for instance, as you go through your medical training, you learn a lot about diagnostic testing, right? So, you, so as an emergency physician, I got a lot of training around how to use a troponin, which is a blood test to look for um, damage to the heart and how to apply that test correctly in a variety of clinical settings. Like that was part of my medical school and then clinical you know, residency training. I think we're going to need for some of these AI tools, we also are going to need to train clinicians um, on how to use them appropriately. Um, and we're going to need to think about standard ways in presenting, you know, AI tools um, so that physicians can understand them and, and also be able to manage multiple tools. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity here as we go forward. Let me, let me add it. Actually, we have been working with FDA on a, on a sort of uh, AI facts label like you have for food, right? On every uh, item of food, where there would be the level of evidence, the level of reference standard, et cetera. Of course, first of all, we need to agree on what is a good reference standard, what is a bad, et cetera. But, but there is some movement and I think that will be really helpful, but that's a few years away, I'm afraid. Yes, I'll just put in a plug for my colleague, Sarah Gerke. She wrote a paper on that very subject. Um, so I'd recommend that to anybody who's interested. Um, I did get a, a question in the chat here about reimbursement. And the question is basically asking in light of paratherapeutics bankruptcy, how do we ensure that there's a sustainable business model for digital therapeutics? What are the ways? What are what... I, I love taking that. So is it okay? Or Leah, you want to start first? Okay. Um, so I think that that is key. Like, like with my example, it, every they had everything done except that, right? And still they're dead. And so, I, like I mentioned, I think stakeholder support is crucial. Any group, patient group, ethicist group, pay group that doesn't want it, and everyone else wants it, it's dead in the water, in my view. And I've seen it happen. If you go to the CP2 editorial panel, where I, I've <laughs> signed these NDAs, so I cannot disclose much, but I do know there's companies there that have been waiting eight years for a category three code. And if you're aware, category three code is not even leading to reimbursement. It just means that you're going to measure and be allowed to measure utilization and hopefully showing enough utilization. So a few years later, you can move to a category one code. So there's this, depending on the stakeholder and enthusiasm that you see, the, the level of evidence for improving the patient outcome, health equity, all these factors that really go into every small item on the way to reimbursement. Then CMS, in, in our case, spent more than 30 pages on three different proposed rules in the Federal Register on what they call the guardrails around AI. What they didn't want is set a precedent for all sorts of bad AI that we're discussing now to be reimbursed and blowing up the budget. So they want to be very careful and say, is biased address, which normally CMS doesn't really think about, they now have to think about all these different aspects of how AI can cause harm, right? Uh, data usage, et cetera. They were really, really very considerate in, in their decision to, to do this reimbursement. I think the framework, uh, because essentially in many cases, uh, and most even most physicians are not aware, the, the physician fee schedule, which is core of CMS, and for many payers, the example to follow for private payers, is really the what's what the charge is. And the charge, 
uh, it can then be reimbursed. So the physician pays a charge and then it can be reimbursed from, from, by the payer. So in some way as an AI creator, you have to decide what is the charge I set. And if that's very high, that looks very promising, but you know, people say, well, why should we pay for this? Is this cost effective, et cetera? You get all these considerations. It's very low. Typically, if you're an AI creator, your investors will say, this is not a sustainable business model. You know, we, we cannot support this. So you need to have the speed spot. I think the model we proposed, which is we call an equity enhancing model, where we said in this case, for this specific diagnostic procedure, right now, instead of 100% of patients getting it, it's a big source of health disparities. Most underserved patients are not getting it, and only 15 to 30% are getting it. Clearly, there's a willingness to pay for this 30%. Let's now set the charge for the AI where we can do all 100% of patients and not blow up the budget, meaning with the same amount that we're, the same expense that we're currently paying for 30%, we'll now pay for 100% and we'll set the charge that, that we as AI creators set accordingly. So now you go into these meetings and they say, well, clearly you're trying to save money here, not, not in, in, increase money. You're not trying to blow up the budget here. You're actually trying what we all want and you do it based on a, you know in, improved patient outcome. So I think that really helped. And we published that right in Nature Digital Medicine now a year ago, I think already. But that entire framework, I, test equations, it actually is, I think, very useful and is being used by other AI creators to set their charge because that's what it starts with. People ask what, what can I do for reimbursement? That's not what you should be asking. You should be asking, what is the appropriate charge that we should be asking a health system, a provider, et cetera? Um, and what is, okay, can I found that in evidence? I think that's what we did and that's why I think it happened. And I think that's a, a good path to follow. And it's such a rich and wonderful answer. It's hard to it's hard to elaborate too much on that. But for me, what it really underscores is how intertwined reimbursement and regulation are. So at least in the health app space, we have certain expectations that apps are available for free. If you're going to start charging for them, being able to build in the ability to get reimbursed for, uh, through insurance is something that could make evidence-based apps more accessible. And to me, it also just tie, it really highlights to me how accuracy and privacy are so linked because oftentimes when apps are developed and then offered for free, consumers themselves become the product because you're able to transact in the consumer data that you're able to collect. So if we do want higher protections and when we are talking about privacy and when we're talking about security, we're now cutting off a revenue stream. So if we can't come up with another opportunity for reimbursement, we're not gonna see the types of positive innovation in this space that really could move the needle for um, consumers and consumer health technologies. So there's a, go ahead, Adam. No, I, I guess I would just add one thing, which is <clears throat> I'm disappointed that both of these companies are challenged and, and did not succeed here because they ostensibly did most things right, right? They spent, they actually validated their products, right? They went up for reimbursement. I, I also wonder if we're just not at the right time for them. I think as I look forward, like we have to figure this out. If you start to look at the demographics and particularly in behavioral and mental health, we do not have enough people to care for the number of patients that need this care and these services. So I think we've got to figure out what services need a human and, and, and particular physicians, um, and then where can we use automation? So I guess I would just say, I hope we don't give up in this area because I think it is going to be the solution. It may take us longer, but it's desperately needed and particularly in behavioral and mental health. Let me push back against what you just said and propose something to the whole group um, is probably will be the last question. So if automation is, well, let's say I agree with you that automation is gonna be part of the solution, but something you said at the beginning of your talk stuck with me, which is this automated responses to incoming messages. And you said that people were really engaged with these incoming messages and they really liked using the messaging service. And maybe we can figure out a way to automate that in some respect. I submit that I, for one, hate using the messaging service. And I would much rather just talk to the doctor for 30 seconds. And maybe the doctor doesn't have time to do that. But for me, that would be more efficient. So I wonder if an over-reliance on artificial intelligence, auto-response, automation, not only will depersonalize further the already depersonalized healthcare experience, but lead to maybe not worse outcomes, but more dissatisfaction with the healthcare system. And how would that 
influence the growth of these technologies further. Yeah, I can start and then let my colleagues jump in. You're absolutely right in raising this. I mean, look, ultimately we want to have multiple channels for the patient to be able to interact with not only the provider, but the entire care team. And what we want to really try to do is figure out what they're reaching out about and balance what their preference is for how they want to interact, right? And this, the nice thing is we can think about what language, what format, right? How, do, you know, do they prefer to use a smartphone and send a message, but also look at the clinical need and whether that, um, that quite how, how best, which format would work best for that clinical need. And I think what we're trying to solve for is how do you do that as efficiently as possible to address the patient preferences, but also address the, the really significant capacity constraints and challenges that we have on the, um, on the clinical care side. Um, and to, my colleagues may have other perspectives on this. I think Leah wanted to respond. I mean, you're not going to find a lot of pushback from me because I tend to agree with you. And I, I know that one of the more recent examples we saw in the consumer digital health space, space had to do with chatbots for therapy. And people tended to react pretty well until they found out that it was a chatbot. And then, you know, statements like, I understand how you feel stopped resonating with them. And I, you're not going to hear any pushback from me because I, I agree with you. I, I think... You know what, what? What we are trying to do, what I have been trying to do, is is bring pay, is bring high quality healthcare as close to the patient as can be. That can be from a specialty clinic to primary care, which is really our focus right now. And then, well, you know, the things Leah is discussing, bringing it from maybe the health system to even the home and wherever that is appropriate and leads to better outcomes. That's where we should be focused. There's a lot right now where what we are not doing. We're not even discussing whether I'm comfortable. There's no interaction of these patients with diabetes with an eye care specialist whatsoever. And they're going blind needlessly. And so I agree with you that there is that aspect. But right now I'm trying desperately, or we're trying desperately to get people the care they deserve and need and, and we want to pay for. So absolutely that, that is true, but there's there's a lot going on that, that doesn't cover that. Okay, so I, we actually do have time for one more question and it's related to the one I just asked. And it's related to something that Michael, you said earlier, which was some of the adoption doesn't happen because of stakeholder disengagement. Basically physicians may not want the product because they think it will put them out of a job. And I'm wondering how do you build or what concerns do you address to get that kind of stakeholder engagement? And how do you build a consensus around adoption of technology like AI and healthcare? Part is uh, ultimately what even, you know, what we all care about is patient outcome, health equity, these things, right? Doing better for a patient. So A, it's, it's focusing on that and showing evidence for that. The other one is, is this message. Well, physicians think about the patients they do see. They never think about the patients that never come to them. They don't have access. And it, it, in many diseases, it's, it's, it's almost a Pareto a balance, right? Where 20 patients get really high quality care. And in so many diseases, many of them never access. And so, but you don't think about it as a physician. You only think, oh, this AI is putting out of business because it's doing the 20%. No, it's going to do the 80% that you're not even thinking about. And so let's worry about your job when, you know, we're doing 100% of patients. That's not, in the foreseeable future, we're not doing 100% of patients. You know, we're deploying AI as fast as we can, but there's so much more we, we should be doing. And so right now, that's, when you explain that, that there is this invisible part of it that you don't think about, then you know they typically become much more supported. And in fact, the American Academy of Ophthalmology is the biggest supporter, as well as the AMA, where I was now 13 years ago, the retinator, right? The terminator of the retina in a big editorial. And so no, I think that can absolutely be changed if you explain it with, with evidence. Okay, well, it's exactly one o'clock. So we hit the mark perfectly. We had a ter terrific panel, uh, I thought a really lively discussion. And I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us and taking the questions and for all of the attendees who came and viewed this webcast. We hope to see you at the next Petri Flom event or perhaps one here at Northeastern uh, very soon. So thanks very much. Thank you.